countdown for blastoff. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, the science fiction classic, Knock, by Frederick Brown. Tonight, we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. What's that? Good morning, man. What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Zan. I'm still asleep, I must be. You are not asleep. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No. I guess I'm awake. Who... What are you? I am a Zan. What's that? A Zan is intelligent life. Look, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? But you mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. How about the people? What about the population of the world? You are the population of the world. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. I, I can't... I don't understand what's happened. The Zan have landed on your planet. We have removed the lower life forms to prepare for colonization by the Zan. When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. What? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh. I'm uh, Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How do you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. It is a primary type of auditory communication. Oh, is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What would you want further in your room? Do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Then you better bring me my books. That uh, there will be done. That's rather considerate of you. You know, I've got to call you something. Do you mind if I call you George? It is immaterial. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Oh, that's all right, George. Just uh, call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Walter. Wait a minute, you're not George, you're different somehow. It makes no difference. The Zan are many, and they are one. Then I'll call you George, too. I'll call you all George. Uh, what can I do for you? Point one. You will please henceforth sit with your chair facing the other way. Aha, uh -huh. I thought so, George. That plain wall is different from the other side, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. How many other animals do you have in the zoo, George? 216. <laughs> Not complete, George. Even a Bush League zoo could beat that. Did you just uh, pick at random? Yes. All species would have been too many. Male and female, each of 108 kinds. 
Male and female, huh? Of, uh, all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Mm, anyone I know? Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, uh, what do you feed us all, eh? For carnivorous species, we make synthetics. The flora was not hurt by the vibrations which destroyed animal life. Oh, nice for the flora. Well, George, you started out with point one. I deduce there is a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Oh? Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. Don't worry, George. It happens in the best regulated zoos. What is wrong with them, Walter? Nothing much. They're just dead. Dead? Mm Mm-hmm. That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, maybe they just died of old age. Old age. I do not understand. You don't? How old are you, George? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I am still young. Yeah, babe in arms. Look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've got somebody you don't know where you come from. An old man with a beard and an hourglass and a scythe. Your vibrations didn't kill him. What is he? Oh, old man death. Down here, our people and animals live until somebody, the Grim Reaper, stops them. He will stop more? He gets us all, George. With your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. (laughs) Looks like he made a mistake, George. And I don't think there's much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. Well, George, uh, where are you taking me? We will be there shortly. We will bring your books and your chair. You mean my lease is up? I, I do not understand. It's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Go inside. Oh, be careful with those books, George. Don't lose my... Oh, uh, excuse me. Who, who are you? What are you doing here? I guess George didn't explain. Uh, George uh, tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What's all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why, but uh, let's go back a bit. Do you know just what has happened otherwise? No, not exactly. Well, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of an advanced scouting party. I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Yeah, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration. It destroys all sorts of animal life. I don't know whether they did it all at once or if they had to circle the Earth a few times, but they killed everybody. No. I was afraid The cheerful note is that you and I and uh, 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You do know this is a zoo, don't you? I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, my hunch is they used the vibrations just low enough to knock us all out. And then they cruised around picking up samples at random. When they were all set, they turned the juice on full blast. How oh, terrible. Yeah, well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortage, wars, even the atomic bomb. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made a mistake. They underestimated us. I don't understand. (laughs) They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can be killed, but the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are, are more than two of us? Oh, not more of our species, no. These were merely fellow animals, a rabbit and a canary. And by the Zan's way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece. It's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in the zoo. Well, didn't they even know we'd all die eventually? I don't think so. Uh, George, that is the, the second Zan I saw, told me he was 7,000 years old, and he's young by their standards. When they learned how quickly we die, they, they were practically shocked to the core, if they have cores. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo. Two by two. What, are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There's plenty of furniture, though, and George promised to bring me my chair. 
We've got to do something. Why? Well, I don't know. It just just seems to me we owe it to the human race to do something. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, perhaps you have a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. Oh, yes, sir. I've been studying them. They look horribly different. But I think they have about the same metabolic and digestive system as we. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. But you said 7,000 years. Yeah, I, I, I think I figured it out. Now, George cut his, uh, I suppose you'd call it his hand, when he brought in my books. Started to bleed. Red blood. But I could see the cut closing as he stood there. By the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Well, you see, whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zan. Their regenerative powers must be unlimited. They just don't wear out. They go on and on until they're stopped. Suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Oh. What would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put up a sign saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'll even have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. It just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought your books. Mm-hmm, point one, eh? Uh, what else is on your mind? Another creature sleeps and will not wake. Oh? A small feathered one called a duck. Well, it happens, George, I warned you. Old man death, the grim reaper, I told you about him. Walter, the Council of Zan has met. It has been decided logically that, A, no life form can withstand the full strength vibrations with which we cleared your planet. Therefore, the Grim Reaper you spoke of does not exist. Mm, pretty neat, George. What's B? B, the only intelligent life to escape the vibrations is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you are off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You've got me. Yes, we have. It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get the information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, now hold on, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Uh, let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. <laughs> Now, you should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more then. It's ermine. This is the reptile cage. Mm hmm. Here are the ducks. That is the male. The female has been stopped. Yeah, lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? Lonely? Hmm? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. Well, you got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us now how it is done. I've told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well, we will have to take further action. Oh, what are you going to do, George? We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Phelan? Uh, you might call me Walter. After all, George does. And we have more in common. Please, what happened? Oh, just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He wants me to tell him how. Did you? Look, I'm just an ordinary anthropologist. There's no telling what those animals died of. Just natural causes. But George can't see it that way. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. Hmm, what? At least we can get back at them some way. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow. If you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? They murdered the whole in the human race. I suppose so, but uh, we can't change that now, so why think about it? We just can't sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. But at least we could be fighting. I can't see the virtue in that. I was more or less content with my books, and we've got George to talk to. Of all the men in the world they had to pick, don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting to the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? I can't really explain it, but... Walter, if there was any good in man, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and, in the end, even against himself. But he kept on fighting for what he thought was right, and we're all that's left. Walter, we, we just can't end by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. There isn't much left for us. We could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend there's a secret about death. We could refuse to tell them anything. Well, there isn't anything to tell. But they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. 
Well, I suppose the worst they can do is kill us. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now you will tell us how these animals are stopped. George, this may come as a shock to you, but I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. Neither was my grandfather. He charged a Yankee battery with one round of ammunition and a corncob pipe. You are not logical, but that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Go now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight, Walter. Remember that. We've got to go out fighting. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Go now, Walter. Goodbye. It's uh, been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Go now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter. (sighs) That was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. <laughs> You are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us now how you stop the animals. Let me alone. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one and two. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, no, no. Let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. It's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. And let me go? That is correct. That's uh, real nice of you, George. I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. No, 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 George, George, you can't do that. Listen, George. George, there is no secret. Can you understand that? There is no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal cage next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. Uh, The animal... Animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, 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 no. Listen, George. You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped... You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you now. I I give up. But you've got to promise to leave the woman alone. You promise, George? If we receive the answer from you, Walter, there will be no further need for the vibrations. Well, I guess that'll have to do. All right. All right. Take me to that stopped animal. I'll tell you how to save the mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Just, uh, just let me catch my breath a minute. What did they do? What happened? After a while, I told them what they wanted to know. Oh, no. As uh, George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. But you promised. I know. It was our last chance to beat them on even one little thing. Well, perhaps. You mind if I sit down? You gave up. Well, I suppose you could call it that. I'm very tired. They've beaten us completely, then. There isn't even anything we can do. The last of the human race, and we give up. We don't even die fighting. Oh, it isn't that bad. Uh, something might turn up. Uh, what did you call me? Uh, uh, huh? No, I, I must have said Martha. Sorry, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late for the whole human race. What now, George? The council of the Zan has met. No? Something wrong, George? A Zan has been stopped. What? A Zan is dead? That is correct. 
Well, you didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Walter. No, no, you've got it wrong, George. The council has decided. This time you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? Oh, they, uh, they have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes. And I... I thought... Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man, Walter. No, not very. There isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait. Hmm? What's that? I have been told another Zan has died. Uh, Now, now, will you believe me? Council of the Zan meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you, it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. What now? The council has decided. This is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zan. Oh, Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George. And uh, don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. aboard now. So wonderful to feel the sun and the wind again. Yeah, they've closed the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Yes, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this, Grace. The Zan leaving Earth forever. They're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's all over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I I still don't understand. Walter, what made them go? (laughs) I just uh, just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know. At 7,000 years, he was going to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Look out for the step. Well, uh... You remember when the first animals died? The rabbit and the duck? Yeah, and their mates just started to pine and waste away? Yes. Well, that worried the Zan. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Yes. And then I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Grace, meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? That's what the Zan wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. But having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Hmm? <laughs> I even showed him how. Here, fella, come on. Come here. Yeah. I held Donald in my arms, and I petted him a while. Then I let the Zan take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. You mean this cage? Mm-hmm. Watch out. Don't go too close. Walter, it's a rattlesnake. Yeah, yes. Their metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch that they could be poisoned. Well, then it was the snake that killed the two Zan. Mm-hmm. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. Well, I, I suppose... I you... thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so ashamed. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought if you hadn't pushed me. Well, I... Well, we've got a world to plan. A new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones it'd be safer to keep in. But first, there's a bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. We've got to make a decision about that. Pretty important one. Yes, but... It's been a nice race, even if nobody won it. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. No. It's the Garden of Eden all over again. Uh, But Eve, you'll have to watch out for that snake. Now, don't. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. No, funny. 
You even blush like Martha. Only uh, you're stronger than she was. Prettier, too. I I I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear. If you'll give me time. Now, Walter Phelan, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that I... That I could... thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. So, Grace, if you could only... No. I wouldn't marry you if, if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. All right, my dear, but think it over. And please come back. <laughs> You see, I told you, it wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes? The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in, Grace. My dear. You see? It wasn't horrible at all. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription... X-1 has brought you Knock by Frederick Brown, adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Alex Scorby as Walter, Laurie March as Grace, and Louis Van Ruten as the Zan. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Now, next week. A strange and chilling story from the Bureau of Missing Persons. The story of what occurred when they accidentally intercepted a shortwave message. A cry for help from a missing atomic scientist who told them the fantastic story that he was now the man in the moon. How did it happen? You'll hear next week at X X minus minus one. Countdown for blastoff. X minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, X minus 1, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Man in the Moon. Attention, attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention, this is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smigley, Jonathan, 5 feet 8 inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid scar behind right ear, last seen wearing blue top coat and tan cap, wanted by Los Angeles... Hello, get off this wavelength. Hello, this is a restricted Earth. band. Hello, hello, Earth. Uh, whoever you are, you're on a hello, coded wavelength. Earth. Tune out. This frequency is reserved hello. for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This 
is the moon Whoa. calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy is loony. This is Jake in transmission. Jake, this is Charlie of the Code Room. Some crackpot is on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. I've got CQ trying to trace a source now. We should have a triangulation any second. Well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham is in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Yeah, they ought to take his license away. Oh, well, here comes Lenny with the directional fix. Right. Thanks, Lenny. Hey, what's this? This is impossible. What's going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycles. Oh, listen, Charlie, unless this is a gag, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Yes, there is, Charlie, straight up. Oh, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal is coming from the moon. Are you nuts? Well, somebody might be bouncing it, like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where'd you study basic radio? Now, listen, Flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. Mr. Timken! Mr. Timken! What's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Listen, Mr. Timken... You know I'm a sober citizen, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, right? Right. In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I well, once ever... What's the ever... matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. <laughs> Well, that's it. He started on voice and switched to Morse. The way the signal repeats sounds like a phonograph record or automatic sender of some sort. Well, what's it say? Uh, let's see here. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Let's have that again. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Otterburn. That sounds like a name, huh? Otterburn. Otterburn. Wait a minute. Something registered? Cornelius Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? Talk to the chief. Hey, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I am going to tell him, Charlie. Hey. Oh, no. This just too much for me. <laughs> Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on city desk. A moment. O'Brien. Seamus, yeah. Charlie Starbuck, down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? All right, shoot, Noodle Brain. I'll stay on your wavelength for 30 seconds. Okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. Yeah. What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus, if you don't know a story when you see one, I'll... I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. So long, Orson Welles. How do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Now, does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist, reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, just five years ago, vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. This is some crackpot trying to jam the airwaves. Yes, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So Mr. are a lot of names. But I have a theory that... I was afraid uh, of that. Henry, you always have a theory. Let's see, what was it last year? Oh, yes. That people disappear in occupational cycles. But it's true. Please, I... Henry, I'm a busy man. You expect me to believe that this Otterburn is sitting up on the moon, sending out shortwave messages? Well, he might be on Earth bouncing the messages off the moon. And... But who's to say he isn't on the moon? Henry, as chief of this bureau, I have my hands full trying to coordinate reports from 48 states in Alaska. I have no time to include the moon. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Uh, but, Mr. Wade... Out. I'm busy. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, here. Take this folder of reports for the dead file. Yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? Yes, sir. I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing persons reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau. But no more nonsense, eh? No, sir. No more nonsense. Hmm. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? You are Mr. Henry Timken. <laughs> That's my name. Permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. Oh, how do you do? Oh, are you a newspaper man? Not exactly. I write as a hobby. Occasionally, the papers give me leads on an assignment. If I may have a moment of your time... Oh, certainly. Just sit down at my desk over here. Thank you. 
My, that's quite a stack of papers. <laughs> Filing. Uh, I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. I admire the precise mind, Mr... Uh... Timkin. Of course. Now, Mr. Timkin, Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon... Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It may be a bounce. They have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, and, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Really? I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my book. Well, I, I don't bother. I... Oh, but I insist. Oh, yes. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Oh, thank you very much. Now, about this message from the moon, Mr. Timken. Well, now, we don't know for sure, as I said. But I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, do you know him? I once wrote an article on his contribution to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn. Years ahead of his contemporaries. Mm. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Well, if you will come here tomorrow night at 8, Mr. Philo, we may learn the answer to that question. I- I've arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. <laughs> Until tomorrow night, then. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Philo. Hmm. Uh, let's see now. Aiken, Abelard, Abramson, Rano, Atch... Well, that's funny. Now, where did this list of names come from? Paul Ahrens, astromathematician. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Carl Parker, mining specialist. Well, this must have gotten mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. Peculiar list of names. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Timken. See, we made the papers. Oh? And how? And as the chief steamed up about it, he really gave me what for. What did the papers say? Oh, mostly ha-ha. Here's a herald, listen... Man on the moon contacts missing persons bureau. Missing atomic scientists sitting on the moon, say bureau experts, etc., etc. What a panic. Well, no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Say, about tonight, Mr. Timken, I don't now, know... Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room. Yeah, but I didn't expect... Well, this. I'll take full responsibility Uh-oh. with Mr. Wade. Uh, the time for the morning broadcast. We got quite a list today. Well, uh, mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Why, well, ain't self-conscious. Just stick around. Yes. <clears throat> Attention, attention. This is the Federal Missing Persons Bureau calling all local agencies. Nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, what? five feet five, brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin, thick glasses. Aaron's. Occupation, astromathematician. Missing, missing since six o'clock this morning. <laughs> being sought by Bel Air Police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat. Dr. Paul uh, Charlie, Aaron. shut it off a second. Hold it. A delay, one minute. Listen, Mr. Timken, it's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt now, us. This is important. Did you say Dr. Aaron's was reported missing this morning? 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. That, are you certain, Charlie? Positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh, let's see. Simons, Robert, what? engineer. What? Came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? Hey, what's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. There's nothing, Charlie, except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk, and that list included the names of those two men who were reported missing within the last hour. What? Oh, that don't sound right to me. Well, it isn't right, Charlie. It leaves a big question to be answered. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? Well, I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas, Henry? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Well, uh, a science feature writer. I see. You were the leak on that story, then? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I was. I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing matter. Well, I... we'll deal with uh, that later. Yes, sir. What's this Philo like? Well, he's, he's a strange old duck, bald, thick glasses, tall. He walks stooped over. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but, of course, being a science writer, he... Is there any other possibility? Uh, I believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That seems to be a very remote possibility. 
The Missing Persons Bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. I do not require a statement of policy. Yes, sir. What's the theory? Well, for some time now, it has been my contention that in a country like ours, where even the cleverest criminal can be ferreted out and located eventually, there is no such thing as a missing person. <sighs> I was afraid of that. Now, uh, for 12 years now, I have kept the central files, where information from all over the country is channeled and recorded. I have made a private study. This is beginning to sound familiar, Andrew. And I have discovered that each year, literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases. And then scientists. And... What do you think happens, Henry? I don't know, Mr. Wade, but I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon, even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Milo? Well, I don't know. But I would like to find out. And you think Otterburn may be a part of this picture? Mr. Wade, I definitely do. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like well, that? It is more than I, an idea. The, the two top men on this list are missing, and... Maybe and, so, uh, but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Why, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, but... And Mr. if you Wade, think I'm going to make myself a laughingstock by accepting such a crack brain theory... Well, I... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes? Yes? I see uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Uh, Henry, let me see that list again. Uh, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I uh, guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. Parker? Third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry... For a good many years now, I've ridiculed these theories of yours. I don't know. Perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you've really stumbled onto something. What do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. I, I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. Good idea. I believe I'll join you. I, I also invited Mr. Philo, the feature writer. Oh? I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in you, Mr. Philo. Mr. Wade, you don't think... That he's that... mixed up in this? Yes, sir. I don't know, Henry. But it suddenly strikes me that we don't know very much about him, really. We ought to contact the police. No, Henry. I, I no. think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. We're dealing with the unknown. And in solving an equation for the X factor, it's often easier to limit the number of terms. You follow me? I don't know, Mr. Wade. I... There may be more danger in what you have discovered than you are aware of. Let's keep it quiet. You agree? Maybe you're right, Mr. Wade. I, I haven't thought of the danger involved. Eight o'clock. My friend Mr. Filer was late. Well, he said he'd be here. He strikes me as a man who keeps appointments. Look out the window. Yes, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. We can't wait much longer. Well, it's a perfectly clear night for transmission. If anybody's sending, we ought to pick it up with this equipment. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. I never realized how eerie this office could be when it was empty. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Filer when he comes. Are you getting anything? Uh, just some foreign stuff, I think. In bit concludes the British portion of tonight's programming from Johannesburg, South Africa. We continue in April. That's a peculiar transmission sound. Earth. Earth. Now that sounds like something. See if I can work the selector. The moon is in phase. Yes. Hello. Earth. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Hello? Hello? Hello. Earth. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Oh, I get you now. Thank God. Who are you? Can you hear me? Uh, who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on, I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. Do you hear me? Uh, go ahead, keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Could you start that recorder, Mr. Wade? Uh, go on, explain, please. Explain, please. Now listen closely. There is an Earth, Earth colony on the moon. 
There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon, made up of renegade scientists and criminals. P- Professor Ernst Halsman... Halsman. He, he died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Halsman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escaped inmates of the asylum. They, they took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 19... 19- 38. Uh, go, go ahead, we're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists, colonists from Earth. S- slave labor, mostly. Uh, I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, I, I, I know, uh, keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive for their flying disc. Uh, Still getting you, go on. Last month, six others and I escaped. Uh, speak louder. You... You've got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony. Planning to take over the Earth invasion. Oh. Hang on. No, 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 no oxygen. Hard to, to, to breathe. Can't you? Listen. They, they have agents on Earth. You hear me? Agents on Earth? Well, where? Who? Uh, hello? 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 Agents in... Henry, look out. Lights. Someone at the window. Get down. Henry. Are you all right? I, yes, I, I, I think so. This shot smashed the transmitter. And the lights. Strike a match. Careful. It was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. We got a recording anyway, but, but not the most important part of the message. Poor Otterberg, suffocating to death. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. He said they have agents. Philo was probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. But the police... Do you think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? But Henry, believe me, they'd, they'd clap us into straightjackets before we could finish. We've got to do something. We need time. Time to get through. Well, you don't think my theory was bunk then? I know it wasn't, Henry. Right now, my only concern is for your safety. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. Listen. There's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. Yeah? We can get down there. There are some delivery trucks parked there all night. We can probably get one started. The garage door's off the ramp, work from the inside. We'll start the mechanism and make a run for it. I, I don't know. I think if we call the police... By the time the police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. That's an order. Okay. But what about the recording of Otterburn's notes? We'll leave that here in, in the safe in my office. They'll never get into that. Let's go. You buzz the elevator while I hide the recording. This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Let's try that delivery truck over there. I'll get in. All right, Henry. You start the mechanism to open the garage door, then jump onto the truck. Yes, sir. We'll make a dash for it. Uh, Where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private. Miles from the nearest neighbor and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead. Start the door up. All right. Jump in. Here we go, Henry. Cross your fingers. We made it out all right. Anything doing? There's a blue coop behind us, Mr. Wade. It's easily following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue. Now Route 1, toward Baltimore. It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. Oh, he's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes. Why'd you stop? I'll turn off the lights. <sighs> it worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I don't see anything. I think we've lost him. Good. I think everything is going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. (laughs) 
Not much longer now. Is anyone behind us? I, I thought I saw the blue coop again, but I, I was mistaken. Whew. This place is really hot in the wilderness. You can stay here indefinitely to we'll figure out the next move. Now, just up this dirt road now. There's the house up ahead. You're not going toward it. No, I have a better idea. There's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down a hollow where it can't be seen except in the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. We'll hide you out there. Now, we leave the truck here. You'll never be seen. Come on. Yes, sir. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. I bought it about 12 years ago. Come up here in the summertime to get away from it all. There's the silo. Uh, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Be careful of those bushes. Uh, uh, yes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. Pitch dark. Oh, my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up and another door. Steel. This is an unusual silo. Double walled, wood outside and steel inside. Completely fireproof. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. We're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Uh, don't be long, Mr. Wade. I, this, this place gives me the willies. Just a moment. Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It's, it's locked. Oh, no. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade, let me out! I'm not alone in here! Mr. Wade! This must be a light switch. Thank God. Huh? Oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20. Mr. Wade, help! Help! It will do you no good to shout, Henry. Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside. Speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. 15 or 20 of them. They're... they're... Sitting like statues, just, just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. What? They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. But, but who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they are currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you, the one with the scar, is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astromathematician. Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list. Yes, you're familiar with the rest. They've all been, uh, shall we say, recruited. We'll work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. Moon? Then you... you you're one of them. Of course. Oh, yes. There's one whose name was not on our list. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. <sighs> Philo? But I... I thought... That he was part of the conspiracy? contrary. His snooping made it necessary for us to include Please put the man in the window, the one who fired the shot. An agent of mine. The pilot of this ship. Ship? What ship? This silo is camouflaged for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companions will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you... You, you can't do this to me! We have done it. No! You see, there was another name omitted in that list. I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of no. Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage. I won't let you do this! You can't! Please! Please let me out! Let me out, please! It's not happen! Let me out! Let me Since 8 o'clock last night, the following persons Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds, brown eyes, slightly balding, occupation records custodian. 
Repeat, Timken, Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Man in the Moon, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Henry, Santos Ortega as the Chief, Ross Martin as Charlie, Sidney Smith as Otterburn, Bob Haig as Jake, Joe DeSantis as Philo, and Ed Latimer as O'Brien. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the sign on the window said Perigi's Wonderful Dolls. A woman and a child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about Parigi's doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom at... X... 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 Minus... 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 One... 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 Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, X minus one presents Perigi's Wonderful Dolls by George Lefferts. The doll shop stood on a quiet Washington side street, not too far from the sprawling Pentagon building. A woman and child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window at the dolls inside. And the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. There was nothing about the doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom. Mommy, look. Hmm? What, dear? In the window of the shop, the tiny dolls. Oh, Mommy, do you think Daddy will buy me one? We'll ask him when he comes, dear. Should be here soon. He said three o'clock on this corner. I see him, Mommy. See? Oh, Henry. Over here. Hello, dear. I'm sorry I'm late. Well, we're all ready to go shopping. Cindy's been... Yes, well, re- I'm afraid we'll have to call off the shopping, Elmer. Oh, Henry, we promised Cindy. Well, I'm sorry, but it's just one of those things. You've been the wife of an army colonel long enough to know his life isn't his own. What is it this time? Well, some more of that flying sphere nonsense. The pilot who says he sighted it last month crashed and was killed today, and the general wants a full report. Oh, dear. What next? Well, I got a staff meeting at the Pentagon at 3.15. Daddy, look in this window. Yes, well, I haven't time, dear. Alma, I... Yes. Just for a minute, Daddy, yes. please. Now, Cindy, I haven't time to stop and watch a bunch of six-inch dolls parading around in a shop window. Say, <laughs> hey, they are lifelike, aren't they? Look at that, Alma. Dolls are marching around like a regular review. They've even got their own little band. <laughs> See the one in the red jacket, Daddy? Yeah. He's the leader. He's bowing to us. Well, uh, they don't look human. Henry, your staff meeting. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. Well, I got to run. Can we buy one, Daddy? Well, not now, dear, and I'll run along. Now, don't go spending a lot of money on that nonsense. No, dear. Bye. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Bye. Daddy. Oh, look, Mommy, the band is going to play. Aren't they wonderful, honey? Honey, I must have stood on this corner a thousand times. I've never noticed this shop before. Look at the man inside, Mommy. Who's he? That's the proprietor, dear. 
Doesn't it look funny with those those red cheeks and white mustache? It's easy to see who he models his dolls after. I mean, look, he's coming to the door. He's coming. Good evening, children. Uh, uh, good evening. How funny he talks. Hush, Cindy. Uh, would you like to step inside the shop of Santo Pirigi? Well, yes, we would. But... Uh, this way. Mommy, it's like, like fairyland. Here in the shop of Santo Pirigi, creator of Pirigi's universal, wonderful dolls, the world of adult reality is blended with the world of child's fantasy. This is a new shop, isn't it, Mr. Pirigi? What is new and what is old? Come, this way. Would you like to meet one of my little ones? Oh, yes. Now, this one in the red jacket is Toto. He's the leader. <clears throat> Handle him ever so gently. See, I will set him on the table. Speak, little one. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Oh, oh my, he talks. The doll talks. Oh, amazing, absolutely amazing. That is nothing for Pirigi's wonderful dolls. Listen, sing. Sing, Toto. Sing for the little girl. My name is Toto. <laughs> <laughs> Sing, Toto. Men are big and tall. Dolls are very small. When men begin to fall, the dolls will rule them all. <laughs> oh, more, more. Uh, how do they work, Mr. Parigi? How do they work? Ah, that is the secret of the great Parigi, greatest of all doll makers. To make an ordinary doll is nothing. To make a perfect replica, that is something. But to make a doll with intelligence, that is the work of an artist, eh? I suppose that they're very expensive to buy. But Pirigi does not sell his dolls, madam. You don't sell them? When I construct a doll like Toto, I cannot bear to be permanently separated from him. So instead of selling, I rent my little people. You do? You rent dolls? Precisely. Ten dollars. For how long? For as long as they are cherished. My only request is that when you grow tired of my dolls, you return them to me in good condition. Oh, Mommy, could we take him home? Take him home! Take him home! Take him home! <laughs> oh, look, he's bowing and dancing. He wants to well, come. Honey, your father said that we shouldn't spend a lot oh, of money. Oh, please, I'll take such good care of it. Please. Well, honey, we'll have to deal with your father later, but... Well... Oh, Mommy! All right, Wrap him up, Mr. Parigi. But I have a feeling that when your father comes home, we'll be sorry. Be sorry, be sorry, be sorry, be sorry. <laughs> now, Toto, this is my room, and you're going to sleep right here next to my pillow. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't laugh like that. I'm going to have to teach you some manners. <laughs> and you be quiet because my daddy will be home soon. And he's a colonel in the Air Force staff. And he'll bust you to private if you don't behave. Come along now. I'm going to introduce you to my puppy dog, Mr. Blister. So be good. Here, Mr. Blister. Here, Blister. Come on. <laughs> Mr. Blister, this is Toto. Dear, I don't think Mr. Blister likes you, Toto. Come over here and shake hands with Toto, Mr. Blister. Come on now. Mr. Blister! Get him! Go! Get him! Get him! Go! Let him go! Get him! Mr. Blister, come over here. Come over here. Sidney, what happened? Mr. Blister tried to bite my doll. How frightened he is. Oh, honey, dolls don't get frightened. But he was frightened, Mommy. He screamed. You imagined it, dear. It's only a doll. He did. He did. Well, Mr. Blister didn't mean it. Now, you know he's the gentlest little pup alive. He is, and he's nasty, and I hate him. Oh, <laughs> now, see, you've hurt his feelings. I don't care. He tried to bite my new doll, and I don't ever want to see him again, ever. Oh, dear. All right, Mr. Blister. You come downstairs with me. Cindy's angry with you tonight. I'll kill him. Cindy! Where did you learn a thing like that? I... Toto said it. Honey, 
You've had a, a very exciting day. Now, brush your teeth now and go to bed, hmm? Daddy's coming home late, so he'll see you in the morning. Good night, dear. Sleep well. Hate him. <laughs> Hate him. Hate him. Hate him. Hate him. Hate <laughs> him. Morning, Alma. Breakfast ready? In a minute, dear. Mm. How was the staff meeting last oh, night? Horrible bore, as usual. I don't know what's got into the old man. Just because a few farmers corroborated the pilot's report, he thinks some strange aircraft has penetrated our radar zone. <laughs> well, where's the little one? Up in her room. <laughs> now, that's funny. She's usually down here before me. Well, she's probably up to something. Sit down, dear. Mm. Say, remind me to take some papers back to the war department, will you? I left them in my strong box. You haven't been bringing your reports home, have you? Well, it's safe enough. Well, you told me it was against regulations to bring secret papers home. Well, I had to finish some work for the old man, and nobody will ever know the difference. Well, I don't know. Oh, would you feed the puppy before we sit down, Henry? Mm, yes. His bowl's under the sink. Where is he? Say, that's funny. Uh, here's his supper from last night, only half eaten. <laughs> He's getting fussy. Doesn't like canned dog food anymore. <laughs> Here, Blister. Here, Blister, Blister, Blister. I wonder where the Dickens is that mutt. Maybe he's on the back porch. Here, Blister. Hey. Alma. What is it, dear? Alma, look. <gasps> Henry, is he? He's dead. But how? But what he looks of it, he, he might have been poisoned. But who would do a thing like that to an innocent little puppy? I don't know. Let me see his dish. I don't understand this at all. Not at all. What, dear? What is it? There are pieces of broken glass in this food. Blue glass, you see? How? Henry. What? I just remembered something. What? It may be coincidence, but in the bathroom this morning... Well, what about the bathroom? Oh, Cindy's blue glass, the one with the Mickey Mouse on it, was broken. I found pieces in the wastebasket. I meant to ask her about oh, it. Alma, for heaven's sake, you aren't suggesting that our little girl... Well, she loved Blister more than anyone. Not last night, she didn't. Why not? He went after Toto. Now, who is Toto? That's her new doll. Her what? Honey, I was meaning to tell you. But you you bought her one of those dolls, I, huh? I just rented it. Well, rented it. Now, look here, Alma. You know we haven't got the kind of money to throw away Well, she on... had her heart set on it, dear. I used my dividend. <sighs> All right. But what happened with Blister? Well, he went for the doll, and, and Cindy said she hated him. Well, a child... She is... said she'd kill him. Where'd she get a thought like that? I don't know. Has she been watching those chillers on television? I don't know. Well, it's too ridiculous. Good heavens, a nine-year-old child putting ground glass in dog food, she'd have to be a monster. Mommy! She's coming. Well, don't say anything. I'll talk to her. Morning, dear. Morning, Mommy. Morning, Daddy. What's the matter? Uh, sit down, dear. Yes, sir. Uh, now... Your mother tells me you broke your blue drinking glass. Oh, no, I didn't break it. Cindy. I didn't. Well, now, somebody broke it. It wasn't your mother and it wasn't me. It must have been Toto. Cynthia. Cindy, you know Toto is only a doll. Now, a doll couldn't have broken your glass, could he? Well? I guess not. So we can't very well blame it on a doll, then, can we? But he must have done it, Daddy. Cindy, you know how Daddy feels about little girls who tell fibs. Now, did you break your glass and maybe accidentally get some pieces into Mr. Blister's dish to sort of punish him for biting your doll? No, Daddy. Well, I'd hate to think you'd done something you knew was wrong and you were blaming it on a doll. Is something wrong with Mr. Blister? Is he sick? Worse than that. Henry. And the child has to face reality, Alma. What's the matter with Mr. Blister? He's dead, Cindy. Oh, no. We can't be dead. He isn't dead, Daddy. No, he isn't. He isn't. Mommy. Honey, he is dead, Cindy. But he'll come back. He has to come back. No, darling, he won't come back. Ever? Not ever. Yes. Uh, now that we've told you, Cindy, do you want to change your mind about the glass? And we leave her alone, please. You think I killed him? Now look what you've done. The child feels guilty <laughs> enough, My, my Henry. dear, this is no time for feelings to interfere. You go up to her room, honey. Daddy and I'll be up in a minute. I don't want to. Please, Cindy. Now we'll be right up, please. There. That's a good girl. 
Close the kitchen door behind you. Mr. Blister's dead. He isn't coming back. Ever. Ever. Daddy thinks it was me, but... It was you. It was you. your supper, dear. I'm not hungry. You scarcely touched your lunch. I don't feel like eating. Is it Mr. Blister? <laughs> now answer your mother. She'll work it out her own way, Harry. Well, I don't know, Elma. When I was a boy, there was such a thing as discipline. Now, the way this child is being brought up... Henry! Well, it's true. There's no respect, lying and... <laughs> oh, there, there, honey. Now, your father's upset. He doesn't mean well, it. what's happened to us? We were a nice, peaceful, happy family until you bought that cursed doll. Now who's blaming things on the doll? Well, it's true. It's... Oh, now I've spilled my coffee. I'll get you another cup. Never mind. I'm late now. I better be going. Oh, you uh, wanted to get some papers from the strong box. Oh, yes. Cindy, please, try to eat something. Yes, ma'am. Alma! Alma! What is it? Alma! It's gone! What's gone? The box, the strong box is gone! It can't be! The door to your study's always locked. You and I, I have the only keys. Yeah, I know all that, and I tell you it isn't there. Well, who would go? I don't know. Alma, those confidential reports, if they ever got into the wrong place. I hands... warned you about keeping them well, there. What if it ever came out in the open? Can't you see the papers? Call the police, yeah. Henry. And throw my army career in a wastebasket after 17 years? No. We've got to find it ourselves. Well, it was there when I went in to clean this morning. What about your key? It's right here. I always keep it with me. It's funny. Oh, no. My other keys are on the ring. Oh, you've lost it. I don't see how. Alma, Alma, how could you do Oh, it? Henry, please. We'll search the house. I can't think of anything else to do. Well, you'll miss the staff meeting. Meeting? My whole career goes up in smoke if we don't find those reports. Somebody got hold of your key and opened that room and... I know. Cindy. You leave the child alone. She's been through enough. You know she wouldn't do a thing like that. I don't know anything anymore. I don't even know my own child. I don't even know you. All I know is that strong box is gone and it contains papers that are dynamite if the wrong person gets them. The question being who? <laughs> What's that? It's coming from upstairs. It must be Cindy's doll. Oh, that blasted doll again. <laughs> Something must have set it off. I don't know how the, the mechanism well, works. For heaven's sakes, let's go up and shut it off. Since you Henry, what? Look, where? What? Around the doll's neck, the key, the key to your study. You see, Alma, it was Cindy after I all. I don't believe well, it. Well, good heavens, do you have to have it spelled out for you? Here's our doll with a key around its she neck. She wouldn't, Henry. You know she wouldn't. Oh, ever since you got this uh, this fool doll, she's been acting half insane. At first the dog, and now this. I think she hates herself. Henry, more. Cindy is my child. I know her. I know she's a good, sensitive person with no malice uh, in you're her. You're simply refusing to face the facts, my dear. What are you going to do? I'm going downstairs and have a talk with that young lady. You're not telling the truth, Cindy. I am. I am. Cindy, now you know that strong box is very important to me. Now, I can understand that you might have been angry at me because I scolded you. And so you took it and hid it, just to spite me. Now, all I ask is for you to tell me the truth. Now, where is it? I didn't take it, Daddy. Honest, I didn't take it. <sighs> well, I suppose you're going to tell me now that a little six-inch doll took it and hid it. Well... I'm speaking to you, young lady. But I didn't take it, Daddy. You don't understand. Toto did it. He's terrible, awful. He says things. He's going to kill everybody. Cindy, you're inventing things. It's true. At night when I'm sleeping, he stands next to my pillow and whispers things to me. Awful things. He told me he'd kill me, too, if I scold... Alma, if I told you. I think this child is sick. I think she needs a doctor. She's frightened, Henry. She's trembling like a leaf. Come on, dear. 
We'll go up to your room. I don't want to go up there. Honey, Mommy will stay with you. I'm afraid he's up there. Who? Toto. Well, he won't be up there for long. Mr. Toto is going right back to Pierigi's wonderful doll shop before I lose my sanity, which means right now. Welcome to the home of Pierigi's wonderful doll. Are you Pierigi? Santor Pierigi, creator of the universal doll, the doll with the mind, the doll which... I'm returning one of your masterpieces. Oh? If you will step into the rear of my shop. Now the complaint. No complaint. Here's your doll. Good riddance. My little Toto. Rejected. You found the world of men too filled with hate. Hate, 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 hate! We will change all that later on. Return to your comrades in the window, little one. And now, Colonel Grayson. I think we have no further business. Ah, but we do, Colonel. Let me see. Ah, yes, here it is. Do you recognize this strong box, Colonel? My strong box? Well, where... My little Toto is very clever, sir. Are you trying to tell me your doll stole that from me? Let us not say stole. I am merely keeping it in custody. What's the game, Pierigi? The game, as you call it, is blackmail. You give me what I want, and I do not ruin your career. What do you want? Information. We already know something from the reports of the War Department concerning a certain strange-looking sphere reported by one of your pilots. What government do you represent? I represent Pierigi's wonderful dolls, none other. (laughs) I am not so naive, sir. Perhaps I should explain. Each man hides something from the world. Each man loves something more than life. With the help of my wonderful dolls, I obtain personal information which enables me to control the men who control the world. You're a madman. A genius. You would be surprised at the list of men who have become the confidants for my dolls. Do you think you can blackmail me into betraying my country? If the price is right. And in this case, sir, the price is your career and the lives of your wife and child. Why are you so interested in the flying spirit? Let us say for reasons of my own. Well, Colonel? Hand over the strong box. I warn you, I have a gun. Give it to me. You are being foolish. Put down that walking stick. Now? No closer. Now? Hello? Give me the police. Hello? Yes, this is Colonel Henry Grayson. I've, uh, I've just killed a man. Yes, Perigi's doll shop, corner of 4th and Lexington. The body is in the back room. Yes, I'll wait for you. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Shut up, you little fiend. Colonel Grayson. Did did I hear it speak? Colonel Henry Grayson. (laughs) I must be going out of my mind, a six-inch doll. (laughs) Shut up, your master's dead. You are mistaken, Colonel. I, Toto... I'm the master. What do you mean? If you will examine the body of Santor Perigi, you will see that he does not bleed. And he does not bleed, Colonel, because Santor Perigi never lived. Never lived? Santor Perigi is a doll. A doll? Doll, but that's impossible. He's a man. He talks. He walks. The people of Meritrix are skillful doll builders. People of Meritrix doll but Look, who are you? I am Xanthus Imperator, commander of the legions of the third planetoid, Meritrix. Legions? Planetoid? My people and I, whom you regard as dolls, come from a tiny planet beyond the moon, so small that it cannot support... Our population. We landed one of our space spheres on Earth three months ago with the intention of colonizing. Unfortunately, 
One of your pilots intercepted us. So that's why you wanted our information. Precisely. Are you, uh, are you, uh, human? Oh, quite human. Uh, Of course, in order to deal with Earth people without suspicion, we were forced to construct Perigi, a man-sized dog. Well, I can't believe this. I'm having hallucinations. I'm going to get out of here. Oh, that would be impossible. We have weapons of destruction quite unknown to Earth people. Well, I phoned the police and they'll be here soon. By the time they arrive, my people will have prepared something quite shocking. <laughs> Cover him, Ryan. Okay, Sarge. You the guy who turned in the call? Yes. Where's the body? Well, it isn't exactly a body. What do you mean? It's a doll. A what? Well, you've got to let me explain. Now, this sounds fantastic, but I've stumbled onto an unbelievable plot to control the world. Keep talking. Now, these little dolls, they aren't really dolls. They're tiny people. There's a big doll named Santo Perigi, and he runs this shop. Holy smokes. He's off his trolley, sir. Listen, mister, we got a call that there was a murder here. Now, if there was one, where's the body? Behind those curtains in the back. Only, it isn't really a body, you see. What? I hear something back there, Sarge. All right, cover those curtains. Yo, is anyone back there? Come on out. Come out, or we'll come in and get you. Something's coming. The curtain's opening. Welcome, gentlemen. Perigi. Well, this is impossible. I smashed his skull. I. You know this guy? Yes, that, that's the one. That's the doll. What's your name, mister? Perigi. Santo Perigi, creator of the Universal Doll. You ever see this man? Never until just now. What? Well, he's lying. I tell you, he's nothing but a life-size doll. The real masters are these little dolls. Ryan, are you getting this? He's wacko, Sarge. Nutty as a fruit. Look, look, I'm not crazy, I tell you. I can prove it. They, they must have fixed up his head when I when I smashed it in. T- touch him, you'll see. Mr. Perigi, you know what the guy is talking about. The man is demented, obviously. No, no, look, I tell you, there's a there's a plot to control the earth. Listen, you you've got to let me call the War Department. They'll want to know about the flying sphere. Holy mackerel, this gets worse every minute. Ryan, take him to headquarters. Save some time. Take him down to the psycho ward. Okay, Buck Rogers. Uh, look, I'm along nice look, look, and quiet look, you've got to listen to me. Don't you see the future of mankind is at stake? Sure, sure. I know how it is. Look, he's nothing but a man-sized doll. Touch him. And the little ones are going to take over the earth. I know. I had the DTs once. Okay, Sarge. Oh, we'll see you later. Please, please. Come along. Please, now. listen to me. You've got to listen to me. Sorry to cause all this trouble, Mr. Perigi. Not at all, sir. Not at all. <laughs> Well, I'll be. Well, nah, that ain't the cutest little doll. Say, my little girl will be nuts for that. But perhaps you will accept it as a gift. Well, now, For saving I... my life. That madman might have killed me. No home is really complete without one of Kirichi's wonderful dolls, Sergeant. Is that right, Toto? <laughs> yes, but I... I, I, I would like in some way to show my gratitude... You will be doing me a favor if you will take the doll home to your little daughter. (laughs) Say, this ought to make her the happiest girl in the world. Yes, Toto will come (laughs) as a great surprise. A very great surprise. (laughs) Won't it, Toto? Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Perigi's Wonderful Dolls, written by George Lefferts. Heard in the cast were Janet Alexander as Cindy, Anne Petoniak as Alma, Nelson Olmsted as Henry, Joe DeSantis as Perigi, Michael O'Day as Toto, Ken Lynch as the Sergeant, and Frank Milano as Ryan. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Tonight's story concludes the present series of stories of the world of the future. If you'd like to hear X-1 return to the air at some later date, please drop us a postcard or letter addressed to X-1, care of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, New York. (laughs) 
countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Night story, The Green Hills of Earth. The men who pioneer the trade routes of the world, the sailors of the clipper ships, the whaling men, railroaders, black gangs on the tramp steamers, all have their own stories and song about dangers and struggles of their lives. This is the story of Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways. When I first met him, he was hustling drinks in the Twin Moons Bar at Dry Waters, Mars. He'd won a guitar off a Chinese barkeep at Luna City by uh, cheating at one thumb. And he made his whiskey by singing in the bar and passing the hat. Hey, listen to a Hertzman. Don't you sing pretty? Like a 16-year-old gal. <laughs> Hey, uh, Riesling, look over there at the bar. There's an Institute for Striper giving you the idea, you know? Manner of speaking. Cold looking scoundrel, ain't he? Mm. Gives the idea he graduated Harriman Space Institute, three men above St. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? Captain Higgs off the ghost show. Yeah, well, he sure gives you the once over. Maybe he's got a job. That don't make never no mind to me. I've been blacklisted. Hicks logged me for making up a song on watch. Right fight song, too. Oh, the skipper is a father to his crew. Yeah, yeah, well, well, hold on. Here comes old brass arm. Oh, uh, Riesling, I've been looking for you. You've kept your nose clean, and we're going to give you another chance to get back to deep space. Been a little changing down there from the Gorshawk, ain't you, skipper? How'd you know that? Well, you got that new atomic pile drive. If there's been a leak at the shops, oh, I... Now take it easy, skipper. You'll have that gold braid just to crawl and right up your arm. Quit stalling, Riesling. Take it or leave it. It's a loop trip to Jupiter with the standard release. <laughs> I reckon... Double pay when you get back, if you get back. Last three of them atomic tea kettles blew somewhere in the asteroids. If you're scared. Scared? Well, that gosh hawk is one stinking old tub. Her engine's got more bugs than a beagle dog in spring. And her new drive's about as safe as a pretty gal in the Ozarks. But I reckon she'll do for one more trip. Hi, Jimmy Lake. Meet my friend Hertzman. He can't hold his liquor no more than a sieve, poor boy. <laughs> Riesling, you sober enough to sign the book? Drunk or sober, I make my mark. Stand aside. Three X's? Took me a middle name. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. You two lay below. And Hertzman, yeah? get him sobered up before the skipper makes rounds. Cargo stowed, Captain. Fuel lines away and ready. Uh, good, Casey. Well, what's that? What it? Oh, that's a guitar, I guess. If it's that shoeless hillbilly, I'm going to tell him. Hi, hey, Skipper. Riesling, what the devil are you doing up here? That number two jet ain't fit. Cadmium dampers are warped. Crooked like a turtle's back. Well, why tell me? Tell the chief engineer. I did. He says they'll hold. Well? He's wrong. Oh, he's wrong, eh? He's got a Harriman Institute degree in electronics and power. And some drunk space rat says he's wrong. Skipper, I was damping jets when that shirt tail Tad wore pins for buttons. I got no time for you, Riesling. Scratch your name off the book no, and No, 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 don't get excited. Well, are you shipping or not? I reckon, I reckon. Then get below. That's all. Casey, sound take off. Aye, sir. Come on, boys. Uh, 
On a hawk class clunker in those days, damping was done by hand with a multiplying vernier and a danger peeper. Jetman slept with one ear tuned to that, and as long as the peeper ticked off slow and steady, we knew the ship was safe uh, for a while. Reesley, you better stole that guitar. If Jimmy Legs catches you, he'll blow a gasket. Don't worry, I could damp this tea kettle in my sleep. Yeah, how's number two? All right, so far. Say, did you ever hear that song about Hicks? The one that got me blacklisted? No. Oh, the skipper is the father of his crew. A gentle guide and light to me and you. <laughs> but on Mars, he likes his women if they walk or if they're swimming. Or if they got six arms instead of two. <laughs> Second verse is better. Yeah. <laughs> the skipper likes his liquor by the court. Yeah, he'd go from Mars to Venus for a snort. <laughs> He'll drink rocket fuel and... <laughs> well, hi, skipper. Didn't see you come in. Uh, you were uh, too busy, eh? Who's watching the gauge? I got an eye on it. Don't you fret none. Reasonably, I'm going to fix it so you couldn't get a space berth on a rocket-powered pogo stick. You're locked. Report the casing under arrest. I don't rightly think I will, Skipper. You what? Well, you kind of forget, Skipper. According to space code, you can't remove a jet man till the end of the watch, right? You tell me, I... I... Riesling, your ship is over at 2300. And I'll see you ride the rest of the way in slop locker. Maybe, maybe. In the meantime, you clear out of my power room. I'm going to make me up a third verse from a song. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. Power room. Damp number two, a point. Number two, I... Hold on, Hertzman. Jimmy Legs, is that force drive boil up there? Give me that, Casey. Riesling, I've taken about enough from you. And I got a little news for you, Skipper. Number two jet is bulging like a fat lady in a satin skirt. Listen, you clown. Damp number two, a point. Why, sure. Look out, Hertzman, I'll take it. You watch the gauge. Now... Riding easy here. It's bucking a little. What? What? Uh, Riesling. What? Hit the emergency. All right. Uh, uh, she, she won't damp. It's that warp. Yeah. Huh, let go the lines. Duck her. Uh, duck. Riesling. Uh, Riesling. Stay down behind the baffle. I, I've got to take a look. It's ready. Right. You look out. I've got to fish the hot stuff out of the tube. What's going on down there? Shut up, Jimmy Legs. I'm busy. <sighs> She's tight now. What happened? Number two blew your lunk-headed space rat. You all right? Oh, a little sunburn. Lights are gone. What's the matter with the emergency uh, circuits? Riesling. Uh, Jimmy Legs, get some lights down here. It's dark. Get the emergency yeah, light but, on. But they're on, Riesling. Uh, well, they went on right after the blast. The lights are on. What are you talking about? It's dark. Jimmy Legs? Jimmy Legs, t- turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. <laughs> That blue, radioactive glow from the jets was the last thing Riesling ever saw. His optic nerve was burned out in an instant. He was in sick bay on the rest of the trip, and on the swing back, we set Riesling down at dry water. I ran into Riesling about two months later, playing his guitar on a jetty that ran out into the canal. He had a dirty rag tied over his eyes with a jetman's knot, and his hat was on the wharf beside him. When he finished, uh, we walked out along the canal. Yeah, I'm doing right fine. Working saloons mostly. And I've been thinking some funny songs, Hurts. The words come out different than they used to. Come on along the canal with me. Sure. Here, take my arm. <laughs> I know the way. That's another funny thing, Hurts. I figure I know it better than other folks. Look back there, towards the city. What do you see? Ooh, new factory buildings? You could smell them from here. I still remember them old Martian towers, old before Bible times on Earth. Thin and graceful like the, like the fairy palaces my old grandma used to tell about down home in the hills. Yeah, they torn them down now, or else blocked them up with cinder blocks. Hertzman, when I stand out here in the canal, I, I can see it the way it used to be. The water, ice blue, with the stars shining up out of it. Way off there, the city with the towers sweeping up like a... Like a bird a flying off a tree. I can see it. Hmm. Now it's the dirtiest stinkhole in the system. Not to me. Listen, Hertzman. 
Bone tire the race that raise the towers Forgotten are their lords Long gone the gods who shed the tears That lap these crystal shores Slow beats the time-worn heart of Mars Beneath this icy sky The thin air whispers voicelessly That all who live must die Don't <laughs> I can't figure myself. I never put words together like that before. I reckon it's just I, I got time now to study the words and shine them up in my head till, till they sing true. Why don't you go home, Riesling? Home? Earth. I've been thinking about that, hurts me. When I was a young and down in the Ozarks, I used to climb a big old oak tree my daddy had in the dooryard. You could see the hills for miles, green and cool. I've been thinking about that. Well, why don't you go back then? Someday. Someday hurts me, but I, I couldn't face those hills now. I couldn't stand to see black when I knew they was lying all around me, cool and green in the sun. I, I couldn't stand that. Yeah. Well, let's get back to town, Hertzman. I, I made three and a half dollars marching today. And I'm all set to drink it down before dawn. Come on. <laughs> I lost track of Riesling after that. I shipped out in a slow freight of the Condor class for Luna. And he hits the hike to, to Venusburg and an ore ship in, a, in the Triplanet run. And so he beat around the system. Venusburg to Layport to dry water to New Shanghai and back. Any spaceport was his home and no skipper refused to lift the extra mass of Riesling and his guitar. He made up his song, sitting out watches down in the power rooms with old shipmates while the monotonous beat of the jets shook the hull plates. Hear the jets, hear the jets. Hear them snarl at your back when you're stretched on the rack. Hear the jets. Feel the pain in your ship, feel a strain in your grip. Hear the jets. Feel her rise, feel her drive, strain and steel come alive on her jets. On her jets. Little by little, his songs began to travel along with spaceways ahead of him. Raw spaceman songs. A different kind of song. Strange, sad songs, like the ones you find printed in the centennial editions. Well, there's one called Dark Star Passing and Death Song of a Weed Coat. And then finally, The Green Hills of Earth. It grew for 20 years, that song. They say it started way back when Riesling was down in the labor camps in Venus singing for the indentured men. When Riesler, well, when he hit Venus, he'd always head out for the backwoods to sing for him. First, if someone will kindly pass a bottle. Oh, it ain't much, Riesling. Here. It'll do. Oh, <coughs> oh what is that stuff? <laughs> Tequila. <sighs> well, you can't make him good here on Venus. Uh, what do you use? Karak bush. Home it is. Home it is different. How'd you come to sign on? When a man comes out the village from the city, he says there's work. You sign the paper and you work. Work? It's work, all right. Ten stinking hours in the jungle with machete. How long you signed for? Well, then I only speak Spanish. I... I don't know. The paper says ten years. Ten years? How long you got to go? What's the use? We ain't getting home. You know how many men die out there in the swamp today? Ten men. Ten. What's the use? My mother, she's dead. My father don't care. Girl? Oh, she says she waits. I, I don't know. You, you sing some more, Riesling. We drink and you sing, huh? <laughs> Maybe a new song, son. We rot in the molds of Venus We wretch 
Stretch out a tainted breath She Foul are her flooded jungles Crawling with unclean death We've tried each spin in space moat And reckoned it's true worth Take us back to the homes of men And the cool green hills of earth Take us back What's the matter? Finish the song, Riesling. I can't. I can't yet. It just don't come. I'll finish it uh, when I go home. That's it. When I go home to the hills. Now pass that bottle. A dawn whistle don't blow for four hours. That's where the Green Hills started. And I was there when it was finished. It was 20 years after that. And there wasn't a man flying or on the beach that hadn't heard of Riesling in his songs. He was getting old now for a spaceman. He was a familiar figure through the system. Tall, gaunt, with that dirty bandage tied across his blind eyes. I was a chief jetman then on the old Falcon. We were cradled at Venus, Ellis Isle, scheduled for a direct jump to Great Lakes, Illinois, on Earth. I was checking in down age when Riesling felt his way up the gangway and came through the lock. Hey, Riesling! Who's that? Mike Hertzman. H- H- Hertzman! What are you doing on this old hog boat? Well, I figured I'd ride it back to Earth. Earth? You're going home, Riesling? I thought you were never going to make that run. What changed your mind? Oh, I've been hankering to set foot in the Ozarks again. Yeah, how about those hills? Yeah, I've been singing about them so long now, Hertzman. i I got to finish the song. i I got to set foot in the dooryard and hear the wind through that oak tree. <laughs> it's about the last thing I'll be doing. I've I, I got to get home before... Uh, look, Riesling, there's a new company policy in effect now. No more deadhead rides and new code books in force. Oh, that don't bother me none. I, I'm riding it back to Earth. I'm going to finish my song. It, it's got to be there. Yeah, but the skipper's one of them youngsters fresh out of Harriman Institute cadet training. He'll throw the book at you. At me? I've been around space as long as Haley's Comet and Bruce's Ridge. I, I'm going back to Earth. Oh, green hills of Earth. I'm, I'm going home. All secured, Hertzman? Yes, sir. What are you doing here? Uh, this is uh, Riesling, Captain. Riesling, huh? I'm uh, dragging it back to Earth, Captain. Not in this ship. Shake a leg and get out of here. Oh, no, Captain, you wouldn't begrudge an old man a trip home. I can't do it. Space precautionary code clause six. Now, come on, clear out. Oh, now, look, Skipper, you, you can slide me by under the distressed spaceman's coals in that code book. Distressed spaceman, my eye. You've been bumming around the system for 30 years. Oh, Skipper, <laughs> you, you're making me do something I've never done to no one before. I'm an old man, an old blind man. I, I want to go home. I never crawled in front of a force drop in my life, but you got to let me drag home. The law says a man's got a trip coming to him, and you, you can stretch for a poor old blind man. Now, 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 can't you? you? You got to, Skipper. All right, you old space rat, but keep out of the way. I run an efficient ship, and I don't want any trouble. Oh, no, 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 sir, no trouble. I'll just lay down to the power room. I'd kind of like to be near the jets when they blast off for Earth. Sit down, Riesley. Take a load off your feet. Hey, thanks, Mac. Power room, fire three. Aye, sir. Have you seen these new automatic tampers recently? Don't have to do nothing, just sit and watch. Yeah, where's the peeper? Turned off. It's all automatic. Uh, youngsters have it solved. When I was twisting her tail, you had to stay awake. <laughs> uh, you got the old hand damping plates on? All but the links. I unship them. They, they cover up the dials. You might need them. Oh, the automatics handle everything. Well, you're finally going home, Riesling, huh? Won't seem the same out past the moon. Yeah, I've been waiting for this a long time, Mac. It's going to be good to get home, I reckon. The arching skies calling spacemen back to their 
Trick. Nick! Nick! I got the emergency! I... My hand dampers! Here's the leaks! Mac! 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 They ought to be on the walls somewhere here. Hey, I got him. Emergency squad coming in. Uh, stay out. Stay out. The place is hot. The radiation blast. Stay behind the battle. I got the link shipped. I can hand damper now. What's going on in there? I'm, I'm spilling jet free. Is this McDougal? McDougal's dead. This is Riesling on water. Riesling? Get out of there. You'll kill yourself. Don't worry, Skipper. I, I know this power room like the inside of my shirt. Somebody's got the damper. Riesling, I'm sending in the crew. No use. The whole room will be hot for an hour and the other jets won't hold. Oh, Skipper. Skipper, throw on a recording tape. What? Throw on a recording tape. I, I got a song to finish. And I, I got to make it right now. Yeah. I can hear it. Riesling, the radiation will burn you down. <sighs> She's clear now, Skipper. She'll burn out clean. Riesling. Riesling, are you all right? Uh, I reckon. Pretty sharp sunburn. You'll pick me out of here with tongs and bear them in a lead shield coffin. Radiation's getting bright. I I can almost see it. Bright and rosy like the sun. Like the sun over the hills down home. We pray for one last land. On the globe that gave us birth, let us rest our eyes on the fleecy skies of the cool green, green hills of Earth. That's the way he died. Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways, singing of the home he never reached, the cool green hills of Earth. You have just heard X-1, transcribed by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, Publishers of Astounding Science Fiction. Tonight's story, The Green Hills of Earth, written by Robert Heinlein and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Ken Williams as Riesling, Nelson Almstead as Hertzman, Matt Crowley as Hicks, Wendell Holmes as Casey, Bill Griffiths as Rodriguez, Bill Lipton as The Skipper, and William Zuckert as McDougal. Original music for Riesling songs was written and sung by Tom Glazer. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the strange story of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium and of a patient there who suddenly found himself involved in a game of cat and mouse. But the man had actually been reduced to the size of a mouse while the cat remained full size. What happened then? You'll learn next week. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X-1. X- 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 X-
minus one. Tonight's story, Dr. Grimshaw's Sanitarium. What you will hear in the next half hour represents either a magnificent hoax or the true explanation of the famous Grimshaw Sanitarium scandal which made the headlines back in 1947. The manuscript upon which this account is based was removed by the New York State Police from a fountain pen cover found in the doorway to Dr. Grimshaw's study. We offer this manuscript as evidence only. Whether it is authentic or not, you must judge for yourselves. My name is John Dougherty. I'm a graduate of Hamilton College, class of 34, a member of Theta Alpha. I'm one of those fools who wanted some excitement in life, so instead of going into my father's shoe business, I became a private detective. These are facts. You can check them if you like. The rest of what I write here is so fantastic that I don't expect it to be believed. If anyone should find this manuscript and read it, all I ask is that you notify Miss Millicent Armbrister of 299 Wallace Avenue, Buffalo, that Johnny Dougherty is dead. On the evening of July 1st, Miss Armbruster and I were driving to a wedding. Not our own, although I wish it had been. It was Sunday. And in order to avoid traffic, I took the old Mill Road, a single-lane dirt affair that runs past the Gowanda Cemetery. Johnny, aren't you going too fast? Not for this road. There's nothing around except some tombstones and... Johnny, a... the gate to the cemetery. Well, what about it? That hearse, look out! Look out! We skidded for about 20 feet and slammed into the back of the hearse. The two rear doors buckled and snapped open. It was a freak. A huge oak coffin with brass handles tipped up and began slowly to slide back toward us. Oh, how horrible. You stay right here, baby. You okay, Mac? You don't pay much attention to speed limits, do you, Jack? Now, look, let's not get hung up on who was right and who was wrong. I was going too fast and you were traveling without lights after dark. Let's see your driver's license. All right here. Oh... Private eye, eh? Now, if you don't mind, who does this joy wagon belong to? Go on to funeral service. It's being rented to Grimshaw. Who? Grimshaw from the private sanitarium. Mind if I ask what you were doing after dark coming out of a cemetery with a wooden kimono? We're moving one of Grimshaw's patients to a new grave. They always travel like this? Look, Hawkshaw, how about skipping the third degree and giving me a hand getting this box back in the wagon? A pleasure. You better screw on that cover again. It's going to slide off. Let's get it in the hearse first. Okay, Junior. You get on that end. Okay. You ready? Yeah, lift. Uh, just slide it. Oh, brother, who's in there, King Kong? Look out for the cover. Uh, I told you that would happen. What's the guy's name, Junior? Oh, why don't you ask him, Sherlock Holmes? A real wise guy, huh? I've got half a mind to report this accident. It yeah, will go ahead. See where it gets you. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll deliver the body. Everything all right, Johnny? I thought so until a few seconds ago. Listen, Millie, can you sit here in the car for another five minutes? Where are you going? For a stroll through the cemetery. Oh, Johnny, stop making jokes. When we lifted that coffin back on the meat wagon, I got a good look inside it. Ew. Yeah, exactly how I felt. I figured we'd knock the stuffing out of the corpse, only I didn't expect the stuffing to be sand. What? Yes. That wasn't a body, that was a dummy stuffed with sand, a dummy with a wax face. Johnny! Which brings up an interesting question. Who's supposed to be in that box, and, uh, just where is the dead man spending his time? Sometimes in my business, when things drop off, you have to go out and, uh, well, dig up new clients. My next case was a gentleman named Harlan Ward Sr., a wealthy automobile manufacturer. I'd gotten his name off his son's tombstone. Are you trying to tell me, Dorothy, that my son Harlan was never buried at Gowanda Cemetery? Exactly, Mr. Wood. But why? Maybe if you'll tell me the circumstances surrounding your son's death, I can help answer that. My son was a rather impetuous young man. Tall, good-looking. After his graduation from Princeton, he began drinking quite heavily. After he got into a couple of scrapes, we sent him to Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. 
in the hopes that he could be cured. While my wife and I were in Europe, we received word that he died, buried at Guana in our absence. Last week, my wife and I decided to have his body removed to the family vault here at Short Hills. How'd your son die? Suicide. You never saw the body? No. We couldn't get back from Europe in time. Now you tell me that his coffin contains a dummy. How do I know this whole thing isn't a plan to fleece me? You don't. But you're a rich man, Mr. Ward, and you're perfectly willing to take a chance that I'm on the level and that your son may still be alive. You sound very sure of yourself, Mr. Dalton. My fee is a $2,000 retainer plus expenses. What sort of expenses? However much it costs to take the cure at Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium was just outside Gowanda. Most of the cases were nervous breakdowns and alcoholics. I committed myself as a dipso, and just to make it convincing, I stopped at five or six bars on the way over. I was interviewed by Grimshaw himself, a small man with a fringe of white hair. You understand, Mr. Dorothy. That's not my real name, of course, social reasons. We understand. Our paid clientele is very select, and our rates are very high. You will be paid in cash and in advance, Dr. Grimshaw. How long does a cure usually take? Uh, That, of course, depends on the degree of alcoholism. Uh, This is my assistant, Dr. Boyna. How do you do? How do you do? We are accepting Mr. Dorothy as a patient. Better place him in the ward with Mr. K and Mr. Kreke. Mr. K is a long-term patient, Mr. Dorothy. A highly intelligent man, formerly a professor of plant pathology. Uh, Mr. Kreke suffers mild delusions. I think you'll find him rather amusing. After about three days, my roommates Arthur K and Kreke got used to me. And we even began to play three-handed bridge. Kay was a chronic dope addict, an intelligent, sensitive man. Crakey was nothing but a clown. He kept a big black cat named the Professor, which he talked to as if it were human. And so I said to her, my dear Countess, if you don't like the company of my cat, then you don't like me. She looked at me as if I were insane. But of course the joke was on her because I was. A Professor? The professor is very sociable. Excellent company. Except when he kills birds and deposits them in your bed. He's nothing but a feline murderer as far as I'm concerned. Ah, see? You have insulted him, Mr. K. Come here, professor. Let's make friends. How about giving me your paw? Uh Oh! Scratched me, you black devil. You insulted him. You hurt his feelings. Well, just keep him away from me. It will be a pleasure. I would advise you not to insult him again. Good afternoon and evening. Is he always as nuts as that? Ever since I've been here. What's his problem? Manic depressive. And a little paranoid, too. How long have you been here, Arthur? At Grim Shaw's? Two years. I left for a while, but I couldn't stay away from the junk, so I committed myself again. Did you, uh, happen to know a patient here named Harlan Ward? Why do you ask that? Did you know him? I met him socially a few times. I understand he died here. So the newspapers said I wouldn't know. Suicide, wasn't it? Was it? You're being pretty careful, aren't you? Mr. Doherty, what would you say if I were to tell you that I don't believe Harlan Ward is dead? What? Makes you so certain. He used to share this room with us. He slept in the same bed you now use. I see. He was an alcoholic, doing quite well, too. From what I could observe, we all expected him to go home soon. Then one evening, he had a violent fight with Crakey. Crakey accused him of snooping or something. Later that night, Grimshaw and Voyner took him out. Where? Where they take all the special treatment cases... To the charity clinic. It's that small building on the other side of the stone wall. A few days later, we read about his death. Suicide, they said. Just what makes you think he's still alive, Arthur? This? About a month ago, I was in the garden next to the wall that separates us from the charity clinic. Suddenly, I thought I heard a sound, like a child whimpering. It stopped. And a moment later, this note came over the wall, wrapped around a stone. What's it say? 
Help me, for God's sake, Harlan Ward. Arthur, how would you like to have some fun? Like what? Like sneaking out tonight and going over the wall to the charity ward? What do you say? It would break the monotony a little. I suppose there's no real harm in it. Of course not. I'd go alone, but I'll need help scaling the wall. Will you do it? All right. I'll go with you. Up. All clear. Give me a hand and I'll lift you. Be careful when you drop. Ready? Go ahead. There's a charity building over there, the one with the lights in the basement window. Come on. Let's crawl over. Maybe we can see something. Shh, shh. Listen. Can you make out what he's saying? No, I can barely hear. Good Lord. What was that? Probably some patient having the DTs. Let's have a look. Easy it wouldn't do to get caught now. See anything? Uh, some sort of laboratory. I can see Grimshaw and Voin and something else. What? Well, there's a child with its back toward me. Now take it quietly. It will be easier. Please, no. It will all be over soon. You won't remember anything. No, I don't want to go. Why not give it to him? No, no. Shut him up, boy, now. Good Lord. What was it? What did they do to that child? Arthur, that wasn't a child. It was a midget. The smallest midget I've ever seen. What were they doing? Trying to give it some sort of injection. When it resisted, Boyna knocked it out. What do you suppose they were doing to it? I don't know, Arthur. All I know is that when it fell, it had the face of Harlan Ward. All the way back to our room, my brain was working like some frantic pinball machine. Only the score somehow wouldn't add up. The pieces were there, all right. A crazy old doctor, a brutal assistant, a private sanitarium, and a midget with a dead man's face. I thought that when I got back to our room, I'd have some time to think about it. I'd forgotten about our friend, the happiness boy, Count Crakey. Ah, so, I've caught you. Fine, you've caught us. Now how about crawling back into the woodwork like a good little count? Where were you? Mink hunting. Arthur and I like to go mink hunting at night. You make fun of Count Crakey? I shall report you to Dr. Voina. You'd better not if you know what's good for you. So, you threaten me. Me, Count Crakey. I shall scream for help. Help! Help! Did you hurt him? Just knocked him out. What do we do now? Put him to bed. Hope that when he wakes up in the morning, he's forgotten the whole thing. And if he hasn't? He's too crazy for them to take seriously anyway. Come on, let's get him back into bed. to sleep in my own room. And the next thing I felt was the sharp jab of the hypodermic needle in my left arm. Hold it. It will be useless to struggle, Mr. Dorothy. In a moment, your motor nerves will be completely paralyzed. What's this about, Grimshaw? I might ask the same of you. My good friend, Count Crakey, informs me you and Mr. K decided to do some snooping earlier tonight. He followed you and saw you climb the wall. Crakey's insane. Mr. Dorothy, that is a matter of opinion. Crakey, what is this? Perhaps my assistant, Dr. Grimshaw, would be good enough to explain. Assistant? Yes. You see, I am the actual head of the Grimshaw Sanatorium. Count Crakey feigns many delusions, Mr. Dorothy. But in this case, he is telling the truth. Count Crakey is actually Professor Ernst Hassler. Professor Hassler and I worked together in the Berlin Neurological Institute before and during the last war. Unfortunately, my political affiliations with the Third Reich were under investigation by the War Crimes Commission. However, Dr. Grimshaw managed to smuggle me into this country where I masqueraded as a mental patient in order that we might continue certain experiments which were interrupted by the American army. I can imagine the sort of experiments you conducted. You and your friend Mr. K will discover their exact nature very shortly, Mr. Dorothy. It is a magnificent opportunity to serve science. I passed out. And the next thing I knew, I was coming to in a different room. And hearing the voices of Voina, Grimshaw, and Crakey. As if from a great distance... 
The two or three. Four cc's. Four cc's. How are the measurements? Reducing rapidly. We'll operate at once. Have Werner start the anesthesia. Very well, doctor. Come in. When I came to again, I had a blinding headache. I began to wonder if Crakey and Grimshaw weren't doing something to drive me insane. Because I lost all sense of perspective. The room seemed to grow in size. I don't know how much time passed, but... One day, Crakey came into the room with a bundle in his arms about the size of a newborn baby. The bundle was my friend, Arthur Kay. And worse yet, I was exactly the same size that he was. Let me out of here. Let me out. Allow me to congratulate you, gentlemen. How are you feeling? You dirty monster. I'm disappointed, gentlemen. Do you not feel privileged to be a part of an experiment that will place me at the very top rank of the world's endocrinologists? What are you doing to us, you madman? It has long been established, gentlemen, that dwarfism and giantism result from injury to or malfunction of the pituitary and thyroid glands. The interlock between these glands was thought to be a hormone. I have discovered that this was incorrect. It was an enzyme. An enzyme I isolated some years ago. I was well on the way to synthesis in Germany when the surrender interrupted me. The interruption also limited the number and type of subjects on whom I could experiment. I was forced to find others. Such as Harlan Ward? Mr. Ward was only a control experiment. I suppose you planned the same for us. No, gentlemen. For you, I have reserved a special privilege. You gentlemen will be the first to test the full effects of the enzyme. In short, I intend that you, Mr. K, and you, Mr. Doherty, when the experiment is completed, will emerge as perfectly healthy, normal individuals. Except, of course, that you will be only five inches tall. The days and nights that followed were a living nightmare. A nightmare from which Arthur and I awoke for brief periods to find ourselves in a strange new world. A huge, frightening world where everything seemed enlarged a hundred times. When we finally emerged, we found ourselves imprisoned in a tiny mouse cage. Judging by the relative size of things, we could not have been more than five inches tall. Now we realized the experiment was at an end. That from now on, it was either escape... Or be destroyed. How's it coming, Arthur? Another moment. I think I'll have this lock worth loose. And if we escape, then what? We'll worry about that after we get out of this mouse cage. Suppose we don't make it. At least you've written the story on that scrap of paper. Someone may find it and read it. Nobody will believe it. Then why did you bother to write it? I don't know. I suppose I want the world to know what happened to me. That does it. Help me push the door open. Now what? The first job is getting down to the floor. I think we can make it by sliding down the telephone cord. Are you game? Go ahead. I'm right behind you. Easy now. Look out! That does it. Now, if we can figure out a way to get out of the room, that should be... Uh Uh-oh. Listen. Somebody's coming. It must be Crakey. We've got to hide. Here. The crate in the fireplace. He'll kill us if he finds us. Time for feeding. I trust that you... Uh... So, you have managed to break out. It won't do, you know. There is no way you could have gotten out of the room with the door and window locked. I know you are in here. I would advise you to save yourselves trouble and give up. Very well, my tiny friends. If you prefer to play the game of cat and mouse, then I shall be happy to furnish the cat. There is no way you can get out. What now? He's gone for the cat. If that monster ever gets in here, we're gone as... There must be... Wait a minute. What? You see that thin strand of wire running along the molding? What about it? It's the automatic fire alarm. When the alarm is tripped by a fire or short circuit, all the locks are sprung so that the patients can escape from their rooms. If I can short that wire before Crakey lets the cat into the building, let's go. 
There's a tiny sliver of steel from the cage on the floor. I'll work with that. You keep an ear to the door. Go ahead. The situation is tough as rawhide. Blast this stuff. Hurry up, Arthur, for God's sake. There it is. Stand away. I'm going to short it. Ready? Okay. We made it. There goes the door. Let's make a run for it down the hall. If we can get to the garden, we've got a chance. I smell smoke. The short may have actually started the fire. Come on. Wait a minute. I have to go back. The manuscript. Don't be a fool. There's no time. Come on. You go ahead. I'll catch up. Hurry up. I'll wait in the hall. Only a second. I've got it. Come on. There's nothing to stop us now. Arthur? Where are you? It's funny. Arthur? Arthur? Arthur, what's happened to you? <coughs> This is the record found in a fountain pen cover in the burned-out hallway of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. There's nothing to add, except that the fire which destroyed the sanitarium and killed so many of its occupants, including Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Voina, was definitely of incendiary nature. It is believed by the fire chief that some small creature, possibly a mouse, chewed the insulation off the wire and short-circuited the system. The two patients, John Doherty and Arthur Kay, vanished completely after the fire, and their remains were never found. Whether the manuscript which you have just heard is authentic, or whether it was the work of one of the more demented inmates of the sanitarium, we leave to your judgment. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1